Hello everybody, this is Starman, and welcome back to Let's Play Betrayal of Crondor. This will be our final chapter, unless something goes terribly wrong, because we are literally one fight away from the end of the game. Well, unless there's some combat up here on the floor, first floor that I didn't do. But we have killed the six who, uh, even though we didn't get to that point, had erected a barrier that was preventing us from being able to get to the Oracle of Al. And with them dead, we should be able to get to them no problem. come this way before? We did come this way before. Wow. Okay. More giants and hounds. Oh. Curious he decided to go run and attack Gorath, but... The hallway widened. In a few moments, the path turned, opening into a large chamber where a dragon lay curled on the ground. I called for you, but I was unable to reach your mind. The magician wields an amulet which renders this body feeble, and he is in the process of disabling the last of the defenses which ring the life stone. Makala is reckless, but I do not think he would have crippled you permanently. He may have unearthed some Valhru artifact, likely a product of Lyron Batkos, the master of dragons. While he would be incapable of ruling your mind, he could still command your dragon's flesh. My inability to know my own future blinded us to the possibility. It's something we will have to attend to later. Gorath, I wish for you to stay here and guard the Oracle. Thank you. It pains me that protection is necessary. Pug, you may require my strength when you reach the Sarani Magician. You will have a difficult time in the Lifestone Chamber. No, Gorath. You have already given too much of this quest and seen what should have been seen by no other than myself. You would never have so much as scratched Makala's skin before he burned you to cinders. He would be much more respectful in the presence of magicians and less likely to do anything rash. For now, you have a responsibility to guard the Oracle. Pug hurried Owen under an archway. The corridor angled sharply downward, its rough earthen floor littered with a slippery ceramic material which cracked underfoot with each step taken. In places, the boy glimpsed frescoes of a moored hell-looking race who stared back at him with eyes filled with enigmatic hate, the cause of which had been millions of years dead. Following a slow bend, they arrived at last at what appeared, looked to be a stone wall, but quickly Pug muttered a few words, and the door shimmered away into nothingness. Beyond lay a vast chamber, and Makala was waiting for them. I had hoped for more from you, Makala. When you first came to us years ago from the assembly, I sensed your heart was full of dark calculation, but I had thought with us you would grow to gentleness. We, Surani, are of course bereft of that quality. Save your prattling for the assembly. You have returned my friendship with cold contempt, treated my daughter as a wolf to his prey, and defied my interdict to visit Sephanon. Assume nothing between us now other than the respect due between tra practitioners. Why has the assembly of magicians seen fit to interpose itself into Midkemian affairs? As a whole, the assembly was unable to reach consensus on this matter. They hesitate to dabble in matters that might arouse your ire. Otherwise disposed of a small problem concerning House Okama, they decided those who felt this investigation necessary could conduct it of their own volition. I undertook that responsibility. I should be careful taking such weight upon your shoulders. It may yet crush you. 
Ten years ago, you engaged in a battle to bar the Valhuru entrance to your world, a battle in which you requested the service of several companies of Sarani foot soldiers. As such, the battle became a matter of imperial interest and fell within the jurisdiction of the Assembly. You, however, have thwarted all of our efforts to gather information about that battle and have forbade our investigation of Sephanen. Many sons of great houses fell, but their bodies were never recovered for proper rights. Your attempts at evasion are inexorable, Makala. Never has the Assembly concerned itself with the souls of the dead, and I don't believe they're practicing a newfound piety. You wish to learn how I defeated the Valharu. Indeed, how could we not? The Valharu were a race of unspeakable evil and dread power who nearly destroyed our world. Although my brothers harbor you the greatest respect, Pug, you would be incapable of turning aside such monstrous power unaided. Judging by the numerous defenses that ring this abandoned town, we assume the only possible solution. You concealed a thing of power in the caverns here. I cannot fault your fears, but your methodology has been despicable. The lifestone was created in the darkest days of Mad God's Rage, a war in which the Valhuru stood to destroy the gods of Mitchemia. With it, they believed they could conquer every corner of the universe, and all likelihood they could have. It must be eternally locked away here, and its existence must die out with that small handful as they have looked upon it. You will speak of none of the assembly about what you have found here, or you shall answer to me. I cannot in good conscience keep such a secret. What if such a weapon were wielded against the Empire? Could not such a weapon lay waste all her children? We cannot simply bury such a weapon. It must be destroyed for the good of all future generations of the Kingdom and the Empire. Impossible. We have no way of knowing what would happen if we attempted to destroy it. It may not be tested without potentially disturbing the Valharu whose souls now occupy the stone. As I suspected. You've done nothing to study it. Great though your power may be, you haven't an inkling what secrets lie within. That stone. Its very existence is obscene. It must not fall into the hands of a hostile power. Makala, do not tamper with the stone. It must be left untouched for the good of all. I judge now, as it is my right of a great one of the Assembly of Magicians, it must be destroyed, Pug, for the good of the Empire. And so we launch into our one final combat interface. I don't know why we just don't jump into the attack. They agreed to attack. And just to see if maybe we might be able to pull this off. We can, in fact, cast Dragon's Breath. And, yeah. Can't rest, but this will give us a chance to heal everybody up to full. pass a few more of these to Owen, though we won't probably get a chance to use them. Alright. Hey, Pug's stealth ability has increased. Makala raised his staff. Not wanting to strike down the Sarani, but realizing the choice was being made for him, Pug summoned what resources were left to him after the Timuranian Cup had blanked his spellcasting ability. Perhaps between he and the boy, they could still defeat Makala. Yeah, two on magicians on one should not be much of a fight, but Makala has summoned help. And those creatures are uh, what are known as Dread. And they are uh, rather nasty beasts. They are beings born of oblivion. Their touch causes the unraveling of reality. But thankfully, we do have one other artifact that will help us, since the Lifestone itself is blocking our ability to cast right now with Owen. And I've been saving this for this moment, because in the Crondor the Betrayal book, this actually is how the fight is won. Owen stumbles across a horn, which was a artifact of the Valharu Master of Dogs, and he summons the Hounds... attack Makala. And Pug really got badly wounded by that attack.
thankfully, it seems that my blood can't target us, but I'll bet we can target him. And just to further protect myself. Not my dog! Alright, Makala, you just made this personal. Though I can't really see you from there, so instead... I'll go ahead and protect Owen. Now him... Just for the giggles, since I got one use left on it. That's right, we're putting Makala in the corner. I'm doing this because in the novelization of the game story, which comes in the back of the player's guide, it also ends with Owen finally beating Makala up with his own, with a simple staff swing. Let's see, can I get a clear Fetters of Rhyme shot from here? Not so much. Just to make this interesting. Can I pull him with an invitation? Uh, I cannot. Can he do a... Ah. No. Well, the evil seek worked. Fire nice, baby. Fire nice. It was over. Pug stared at Makala's lifeless form as it lay silently on the hard stone floor. Hiding from the grief that threatened to overcome his pain and exhaustion, he turned to Owen, saw the boy was on his knees. Pug was about to help the boy to his feet when he noticed a strange light filling the chamber. The lifestone pulsed warmth. 
Rays of emerald light touched Owen's solemn features, deepening the hollows of his face as he approached the blasted turf, occupied moments before by Makala's towering rage. Nearby, Pug spoke softly, his voice diffusing off the cavern walls into a thousand bouncing whispers. It may be difficult, Pug said, but don't judge him too harshly, Owen. I have performed acts nearly as monstrous in the name of the common good. I find that hard to believe, Owen replied. You're a good man. So was he in his own way. Loyalty can sometimes misguide even the finest of men. Both magicians flinched in unison as muted sword strikes erupted in the corridors outside the chamber. With startling rapidity, the sounds approached, dissolving into pattering desperate footfalls and howling half-screamed oaths. Watch yourself! Pug shouted across the cavern. Someone's coming! Harried by a shadowy assailant, Goref backed into the chamber, his sword flying in a defensive arc before him. Repeatedly, razor-like fists flashed out of the darkness to challenge him, but he skillfully turned the attacks to his advantage. Finding the rhythm of his opponent, he fainted right when he was expected to move left and a warrior barrel passed him. Denicon! Owen exclaimed. Tripped up by Gorath, the Morid Hell leader crushed to the ground, or crashed to the ground, snarling all the while in slavering fury. Attempting to rise, he slashed upward with his gauntleted fist, but brutally, Gorath stepped inside his guard and delivered a rain of heavy kicks until the older warrior fell quiet. I suggest you lie still. Goraf snapped, whipping rivulets of blood from his face. I may decide to kill you yet. I hear you, Delicon croaked, his voice weak. For a long moment, he remained curled in a ball, his breath tearing raggedly from his throat as he clenched and unclenched his fists. With extreme effort, he turned his head and looked upon the mesmerizing light of the lifestone and froze. No! Pug shouted, his head apprehension glowing within him as a black like, like a black lake as he caught the Mord Hell's expression. Stumbling forward, he tried to interpose himself in the way, but his failing strength abandoned him. No! Swatting Gorath effortlessly aside as he rose, Delicon's eyes flashed with reflected radiance. Like a puppet on a string, he began to stagger forward, his steps almost childish in their plodding. Undoubtedly, something had control of his mind. Dazed but still alive, Gorath leapt to the attack and jolted hard into the Mord Hell leader his miscalculated blow carrying the both of them down, not down, but forward, forward into the life stone. Together they reached for the sword. What madness is this? Who? Something within the sword consumes. Can't fight it. Him. Ashen Sugar. The Valhru souls trapped in the stone are slipping their bonds. We will have to kill them both. But what about Gorath? You must, Owen. Evil. Can't fight it. Him. Much longer. Can't hold him. Now! Owen stared blankly at the life stone. We killed him, Owen said, a bitter hurt in his words. He came to the kingdom to warn us, and we killed him. Don't be petulant, Owen. This isn't a time for it. Glaring at Pug with shock, Owen opened his mouth to reply, but found that inadequate adequate words failed him. Angered, he turned as if to leave, but felt the master magician's hand on his shoulder. Wait, Pug said, his voice more gentle than it had been. Meeting the boy's hateful gaze, he motioned for him to stay. You must understand, Gorath was dead the minute he touched the sword. If we had hesitated another moment longer, both he and Delicon would be dead, and an unspeakable evil would be loose on our world. When Delicon began to change, you could see how the Valerie were attempting to mold him into a form they could use. Do you remember the terrible devastation we saw in Timuriana? That would be a paradise compared to the lives we would lead under their dominion. I am telling you this because you now have knowledge and abilities which come with terrible responsibilities. You will have to make decisions far worse than this someday if you continue down the path you are on. You are going to have to learn to think before you act, but never to regret your decisions, right or wrong. Otherwise, you will slowly begin to not make decisions at all. But how can I know, be know which are the right decisions? Owen asked. How can I be sure? Pug squeezed his shoulder. You need to live to a ripe old age to know that. I am not nearly old enough to have an answer. All I know is what Macross the Black once told me. He said to train those around me well, to make them powerful, but also to make them loving and generous. I see those things in you. But wait, there's more. The battle was against them. Enraged, war leader Moralov growled orders to his terror-stricken lieutenants as he reviewed their weakening lines from the safety of an elm-shaded hill. 
watched with fury as his forward ranks of pikemen retreated under unexpectedly heavy rain of Kingdom Longbow fire. In a short while, the combined mass of Prince Rufus' relief forces and the garrison of Cephna would be in a position to push them into the only quarter of the city where they would be unable to retreat, and then it would be in only a matter of hours before they would be forced to surrender or die in a blaze set to flush them out. Lord Leader Marloff, you must come quickly! Hearing a commotion to his left, he muttered a silent curse on Delicon's head for leading them on this fool's errand, then snapped his attention to a small group of more at hell who were advancing towards him, faces flushed with excitement. Their leader, a scar-faced whelp of twenty summers, knelt reverently at his feet before breathlessly delivering his message. At the keep! Your father has taken Prince Arufa, and I believe the marked one is with him! The tide of the battle turns! Stalking skeptically after his messengers, he progressed through a ruined avenue and into a cobbled central square filled with conversing Mord Hill warriors. Above them, Delicon mounted the fire-blackened parapet walk of the keep, preceded by a mysterious robed figure and the Prince of Crondor, the latter bound hand and foot, unable to do anything but follow where he was led. Brethren! Silence fell over the square as the robe-clad figure stepped past Roof and Delicon and into an archer's turret, a hand placed over his right breast. Ripping open the white garment, he revealed a body made gaunt from hunger, but bearing an unmistakable curling purple birthmark which resembled a dragon, and was the mark of legend. Instantly a chant rose among the Mordhel warriors, many of them falling to their knees in ecstatic reverence. I have returned, O oh my children, Mermadimus shouted from the battlements, revealing a glittering sword of gold, its hilt set with stones of lapis. Hidden deep in the chambers of earth below our feet, Prince Arufa sought to keep this sword from me, from us, the key to our future. For ten years he imprisoned me in the bowels of this hell against my will. But you have freed me, he said, sweeping the air with a sword. Ten years ago I promised you the dawning of a new age. I was repaid with abandonment, but today I am free because you who follow Delicon believed in our dream. You have demonstrated your worthiness and loyalty, and as a reward you shall bear witness to the death of the Lord of the West and the final fulfillment of the prophecy. A dark cheer rippled through the crowd as Mermanimus held the sword aloft and faced Arufa. His lips curled back in a wicked smile as he advanced on the day's prince. Considering the things that had been done to him, the crowd thought it was likely their former leader would execute Rufus slowly, and they were ripe for the spectacle. Pardon me, had to get a drink there. Abruptly, Mermandimus halted. Beneath him, the stones of the keep began to tremble, as if the entirety of the structure were being shaken by an invisible hand. His look of proud defiance suddenly turned to one of outrage. What treachery is this? Mermadimus screamed. Who meddles with the prophecy? As if in answer, thunder pealed overhead, announcing the arrival of a great dragon and rider, the pair seemingly having formed from the very air itself. Floating down from dizzying heights, they descended to a point level with the keep's rooftops, the dragon's wings beating great gales of wind against the crowd. The prophecy is false, Mermadimus, as are you! Pug shouted from the dragon's back. You have betrayed the folk of the kingdom and those of your own people for a lie. It is time for your terror to come to an end. At Pug's command, Arufa ducked, narrowly averting death as the dragon skimmed low overhead, lashing the battlements with its titanic whip-like tail, hurling both Mermadimus and Delicon, screaming like babes into the horrified hordes who watched far below. Fanning away from the impact of the two, bystanders hastened to escape, fearing a possible second attack from the flying dragon and its equally menacing rider. Standing in the midst of the crowd, Moroth looked on, void of pain or fear, his voice calm and clear as he addressed a goblin lieutenant who stood near him. Gather your kid and call the retreat. Lord Morloff, we might still win! Lead us! Calling the green-skinned creature, Morloff lifted him to his feet. I now lead the nations of the north, and my first command is that I shall lead us home. Call the retreat! Morloff spat, hurling the goblin backwards. The day is theirs, but I must see to something first. Disregarding the panicked warriors who sought egress from the square, Morloff picked his way to the burning rubble to where his father lay dead, his wolfish eyes reflecting only the clouds of smoke which drifted through Sephanin. For all his father's grand schemes, for all the things he had thought to accomplish, he was nothing now, nothing but a hulk of dead flesh. He'd been a fool to trust the Serrani magician. Leaning over the dead body, Morloff snatched up the golden snore which Mermandimus had retrieved from the caverns below. Although he knew very little of the prophecy which had inspired both his father and Mermandimus to their deaths, he had no intention of wasting what little they had gained in the battle. Perhaps he returned to the Northlands, he could still find a way to harness the power of the artifact, assuming it had any powers at all. Morloff! Turning, the Mordhel war leader had no time to react before the lightning-quick assassin was upon him, driving a knife skillfully through his left eye and deep into his brain, killing him instantly. Without a sound, he crumpled to the ground across his dead father, dropping the sword even before he could raise it. Smiling coldly, Nareb withdrew his knife and wiped clean the gray flesh from its bone blade, then snatched Mermanus' prized sword from where it lay abandoned on the ground. 
One by one he had borne witness to the destruction of his rivals, Goref of the Ardenain, his own brother Nago, Delicon, and his son Morleif, all destroyed by their own greed or inaction. Now there would be the matter of dealing with the bitch Lilion, who had been Delicon's mate, and then he might claim the throne of Sar Sargoth for himself, assuming no bastard get to the former warlord claim the right. It would be of small consequence, however, for he possessed what they had all sought. Assuming he lived, he would learn to exploit this newfound advantage. Reshaving his knife in his boots, he spotted the slow-moving band of Mordhell limping toward the Dimwood, and he hurried to join them, blending in with the crowd in the same manner in which he had come to Sefanen, as an unrecognizable face in a mob of the beaten and the angry. Arufa watched with mild wonder as Pug conjured the prince's duplicate into non-existence, then, just as quickly, eliminated the remarkably lifelike illusions of Delicon and Mermandamus, who lay crumpled on the ground below the keep. The corpse of Delicon's son would have to be removed later by less arcane means. A shame we didn't have you with us at our Mengar, cousin Pug, Arb Rufa said. A performance such as that before Menace's troops might win us the battle. Pug shook his head. Spectacle won't win your battles, but at least it may prevent the Dark Brothers from plotting another attack against Sefanen. With a dozen or so more to hell witnesses you've left alive on the battlefield, most of them should return alive to the Northlands. Having seen their leaders die and possessing the object Romanimus sought, they'll have little reason to return here. Let us hope, Arufa said. I have little desire to do this again. What about the artifact? Owen asked. A useless sword, Pug replied with a grin. The Oracle of All indicated a hidden room where I might find it when I asked for assistance with the plan. Shortly after that Morad held gentleman who picked it up returns to Star Sargoth, he will discover it useless and curse the names of both of them for having spilled so much Morad held blood on false prophecies. Seeing James and Lockler poking about in the ruins near the keep, Arufa scowled. I have a feeling those two are going to keep me busy for months with their questions about this place. Fortunately, they're loyal. If I tell them the subject is closed, they'll both trust me enough to leave the issue alone. You could always tell them the sword was tr truly buried here, Owen suggested. The answer is good enough for the Morad Hell. Arufa shook his head. Lockler will probably forget the matter once he sees a pretty young face in Crondor. But Jimmy is different. He won't accept it, though he will never ask anything more. I don't like that I have to lie to him. He's as loyal a subject as I've ever had. What about the Surani? Owen asked. Nodding, Arufa seemed equally concerned with Pug's answer. I shall have to talk with them. A well-respected member of the Assembly of Magicians named Hocho Peppa already knows something of the event, and he will help me assue their fears, Pug said. Thankfully, they have their hands tied with another bothersome individual at the moment. Satisfied, Rufa said his farewells and moved off to be of assistance, evacuating the remaining soldiers from the area, fearing that some might become too curious and discover things best left unfound. While watching the prince depart, Pug smiled quietly to himself, gaining Owen's attention. You seem pleased about something, Owen said. What is it? You will note that the prince said nothing about your silence, Pug said. You know the secret of Sefanen. In all of Midkemia, only Prince Arufa, King Liam, Duke Martin, Thomas of Vandar, and myself truly know what lies beneath our feet. As if to reinforce the point, Pug tapped his staff at Owen's feet. What are you saying? Smiling, Pug began to lead him down the winding path toward the city's smashed southern gate. What that means is that the prince expects me to guarantee your silence. That will be difficult to do if you and Tyburn and me at my academy of magicians in Starduck. It will require that I make a number of long, tiresome journeys for the sole purpose of ensuring you keep your silence. It seems a waste of time. Stopping to look into the sunset, Pug seemed lost in thought. Of course, it is possible I could take you on as a student of magic, your living expenses paid in full by Prince Rufa. Are you interested in becoming a true magician, Owen? Laughing for the first time in a long while, Owen trolled his staff in his hands. I've never wanted anything else. And thus ends Betrayal at Crondor. The uh, novel ends slightly differently. Well, it ends about the same, but Owen's final fate, we find out later, is quite different. Uh, it ends on a more Lady in the Tiger note with Owen trying to decide his destiny in the face of everything that has happened, and unfortunately we find out in later books that he went back to his parents and never did progress to become the magician he dreamed of, which rather sad, but by that point, Feist had the future novels pretty well mapped out and couldn't put Owen into them as a character, although he did add uh, Abbott Graves and Cat in, and they went on to have a Destiny in the later books, which I talked about in earlier chapters, but uh, yeah. That is Betrayal at Crondor, and I think it holds up pretty well in spite of everything. I've uh, made some jokes here and there about the plot falling apart at certain points, some things that have rendered this different than the original uh, books, one way or the other, but uh, overall it's still a very solid RPG, and 
one of my favorites of all time. I highly recommend downloading it off of Good Old Games if you have the chance and you want to give it a chance yourself, even though you've sat through me playing through virtually everything in the game. But uh, thank you again for accompanying me on this journey and letting me be your storyteller. And I will see you when the next adventure begins. Until then, take care and have a good story.